<laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> That's right. As I just desperately try to get the calibration frames working. Yep. Um, well, I, um, I'm going to try, I'm taking a shot here, as you can tell. Well, I, I assume, Matt, that they can see my screen. Is that right? No. <laughs> Default. Yeti. Okay. Nice. Hey guys. <laughs> now can you hear me? I've hope hopefully I think I've done that before. That's really terrible of me. <laughs> we've been live. Good we've been on we've yeah, three minutes, but at least it's been three minutes this time. Hey guys, welcome to uh, the, the weekly uh, the virtual star party for October 14th. My name's Matt and uh, and with me, my conscience tonight. It's not just me. It's Roger Groom, who Hello, uh, who, everyone. <laughs> he tells me to stop being stupid, Matt. Um, and to stop doing that sci-fi. Remember that one? Too, yeah, Matt? yeah. He tells me to stop doing sci-fi as well. So tonight is a uh, a good. We can hear us. <laughs> they can hear us in the chat. Uh, okay, so tonight is going to be user request. So uh, we we've put some. Uh, Suggestions up at the very top there with the uh, Discord chat, uh, with some stuff we can start off with. But if you want to uh, join join in and ask uh, request some stuff to have a look at tonight, uh, we will uh, we'll try and do our best. Um, Roger, as you can see here, is just has had a little bit of teething issues to date. Telescopes like yeah, to. <laughs> and they, they, seeing as they didn't get your audio earlier, Matt, they didn't know that I was there. Desperately trying to get the calibration frames working. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Roger, what actually gets involved in uh, with your telescope and getting all these pretty well, pictures? Because here, yeah, well, because here we just put the uh, Nikon on the on the telescope and plug it in and go. So, yeah, um, the challenge for me with this live stuff is the calibration frames. That's darks, flats, and bias frames. Because normally, what you do with astrophotography is you take a whole bunch of images, let's say 20 of an object, you download all those and then you calibrate them by removing um, artifacts using certain types of frames. And um, that's all done in post-processing, but with the live, we have to try to do that on the go kind of thing. And um, and I don't normally do that and I should have, should sort of prepare more, but the, the way I, I normally have in the past run these live streams is um, yeah, using this live stack feature and um, it wasn't working for me tonight once I put the calibration frames in there. And we need the calibration frames because they get rid of dust motes. So you might have actually, if I go back out of this, you can see here on this screen, this is the Dumbbell Nebula, which is the first one mm. we were to show. 
um, and a bit of a streak going off there and here, which is from the residue from uh, Mars, <laughs> which I glued from. Um, uh, and this dust moat here um, is what the calibration frames should get rid of. But um, yeah, and there's another one, but um, I just am not having any luck with this very buggy um, live stack feature of vSky X tonight, but mm. we'll, we'll see. I'm going to try, um, oh, you know what? Um, it probably possibly didn't find any stars earlier, Matt, because we were looking at Mars and Mars just blows it out. Yeah. So I'm going to try one now and yeah, everyone can cross their fingers and see if this works. Um, we... But yeah, so, so in terms of your question, Matt, what I, what's involved? Um, <clears throat> so the, the challenge is those calibration frames, but um, obviously there's a lot involved here in terms of the camera, the focuser, the filter wheel, the telescope mount, let alone getting it in focus. Um, so yeah, it is, it is a little bit of a challenge to do this live. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see all your mistakes. See, this is this is what it's, uh, sometimes it can be really good because when uh, telescopes misbehave, because then you get to see how the cookies uh, cookies made. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, when, well, when we were on a night sky tour and the telescope just decides, I've had enough of tracking properly and uh, people get to see us <laughs> madly. But before we go on, um, we actually had, I just noticed at, uh, at 10, 11 past eight, we actually had our first show us Uranus uh, comment. So I, I just want to say to people, I'm very disappointed. I thought that would be you know, one of the first couple of things <laughs> that would have been said. So I just, I oh, just, I don't know if I can go on now, you know, five, you know, five minutes. <laughs> now we do have to apologize. We do have to apologize to one of our Mortys. Mortys are the uh, our groupies that we call um, Mel. Unfortunately, we we tried to get Zeta Crucis your star, and unfortunately, it's too low. So it just means that we will try and get it to once. Uh, hopefully early in next year when it's a little bit higher in the night sky. Uh, yeah, but it's gonna be a few, few months, isn't it? Yeah, Matt? unfortunately so. But, and also uh, just uh, just with Mars, um, what we'll do is because te uh, Roger's telescope's too powerful for it, we'll just say it that way. Um, what we'll do is once we finish here tonight uh, with this live stream, I'll run up to the telescope up here, attach the Nikon, and we'll do another live stream for about 15 minutes and see if I can last that long in the cold. I don't know if it might be that. I think it's getting a little bit warmer now. Yeah, yep. Yeah, oh, and, yeah. and uh, there is another special guest. You probably won't hear a lot from her today, but we've, uh, we've got to take some recordings for a video of what we do with our internet. And uh, behind the screen over here, we have our cat. Uh, say hello, cat. Hi, cat. <laughs> as well. So it's not just me here as well. So, okay, so, so that's looking really good, isn't it? it it's getting there, yeah. Look, it's, it's not um, perfect, but... Mm. Um, it's it's getting there. So this this does have the calibration frame applied, which is fantastic. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's still not quite perfect, but it's good enough for us tonight, I think. Um, we've still got where my cursor is going through there. That is still the residue of where Mars slewed off the screen off the camera. Oh wow! Um, yeah, it basically the 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 way this is a CCD uh, chip. And it's a very sensitive one. It's made for doing deep sky objects, which is why it doesn't work well for, for Mars. Um, uh, and it basically the the um, cells, the pixels within the CCD, they hold a, a charge. And um, if that um, is such so of such a magnitude, then it can have a residual e effect there um, for a period of time. So we'll see that disappear gradually as these, these images come through. Just like um, the time you uh, you blinded me with the flash at uh, <laughs> at Jordan. You never never let me down. Actually, that, no, no, no. We we didn't actually tell the people how uh, our Geraldton trip went because I thought I'd save that to uh, uh, to yeah. So some of you who've watched this live stream before, while this is while we're taking some nice pretty pictures here, we did have a really good trip up to Gascoigne Junction, and it was uh, fantastic. We want to thank the 
Gascoigne Development Commission for or helping organize that uh, to get us up there. So um, it was a fantastic night. They have had a lot of people from, uh, from around uh, Gascoigne Junction and Carnarvon. Uh, we also managed to go out to uh, the Space and Technology, Carnarvon Space and Technology Museum and uh, the, day, the night before and go and do some photos with the, uh, with the big OTC dish. So if you guys- Yeah, thank you for organizing that, Matt. Yeah. That, um, that was a you know if if you do if you're going to go up uh, while we can't leave the state definitely uh, definitely head up north and where it's uh, getting a lot warmer and uh, there's some fantastic stuff to do the Carnarvon Space and Technology Museum is definitely a must to stop in and have a look they've really done a great job and you yeah. might even get to see Buzz the cat as well there so <laughs> but uh, and we yeah sorry. Oh, and I was just going to mention that yes, I, uh, Roger did blind me with his uh, his flash. We were at the uh, in Geraldton, half an hour out of well, actually half an hour out of Geraldton at a wind farm and taking nice, pretty photos. And uh, Roger decided, well, let's try and get the flash out so we can get in some nice photos with just the actual wind, wind turbines uh, blades. And uh, I have a habit of turning around from my taking my photos because I usually wear my torch on. And I uh, turned around just as he as he uh, turned the flash on, and uh, I lost my my vision for a good twenty <laughs> seconds or so. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I was bl- as the uh, as the song goes, I was blinded by the light. So, <laughs> so it looks like this is coming through good for the mm. dumbbell nebula here, Matt. Um, so it's um, got uh, what have we got? We've got five frames in total there five minutes worth of exposure which is not a lot but it's enough Mm. um we um yeah got reasonable focus um they're nice clear skies which is good um and yeah because of this type of camera as well you do get a little bit of blooming on the stars so the stars are a bit brighter than they might be in some other cameras but that's because this camera again it's really made for super sensitive deep sky stuff and also it's a what we call a non-anti-blooming camera which is most suited to research i I do a lot of research with this um camera in fact the last um couple of weeks i've got back on um a project to photograph a a multi-planet exoplanet star system and so i've been doing that all night every night Awesome. Um, but yeah, well, oh, do you want to say anything about this dumbbell yeah. nebula? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so the dumbbell nebula is a planetary nebula in the constellation Val uh, Val Capi- uh, Pillar, uh, which is I think I apologise for the pronunciation, but that's the uh, the little fox. Now, uh, planetary nebulas are going to be is what is going to happen to our sun at the very end of its life. This one is a about just over 1,200 light years away from us. So the light that you're seeing that's been taken has traveled so long that it left this, uh, this nebula back just probably after the, uh, the Western Roman Empire had, had collapsed. So that's, that's putting into perspective how long this light has, has traveled for us. Now, this is the very first planetary nebula that was actually discovered, and it was discovered by Charles Messier in 1765, and uh, it's, it is a very popular uh, observing target for amateur astronomers as well. Uh, it is about three, three light years across, and it's, uh, the actual shell of material is leaving that central area at about 31 kilometers per second. So imagine going from the Perth Hills to the CBD of Perth in, in within a second. That's a, about a second. That would be, I would love that when I try to go to one. Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love, well, you would love that for your commute to Midland. But, I would, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I'm just thinking of three light years as well. It's fascinating when you look at a, an image like this and you think that in the center there is a star. And if you're at that star, then either side of you that nebulosity extends for one and a half light mm. years so um that that's pretty massive really yeah and they've they've worked out that the event actually happened about uh nine thousand eight hundred years ago just from calculating it's moving at that rate coming back it's around nine you know nine thousand eight hundred light years or uh 
you know, as a 9,800 years ago. So it's, it's, and the white dwarf that's left over is, is actually one of the biggest that we've ever found as well. So it must have been a pretty spectacular star beforehand. So what, so what causes this is that when our star gets to the very end of its life, uh, which it ha what's been happening up until then has been that it's been fusing hydrogen into helium. So think of our star as a massive big nuclear uh, bomb. It wants to completely blow up, and fu uh, but its own gravity is holding that explosion in. And so its, its life is actually determined by how big it is and also... Uh, how uh, and also the amount of hygiene it is if it's a really small star then what will happen is it will be very economical uh, there hasn't been enough time for the very first uh, very first t uh, red dwarfs to die they think there's about a hundred billion uh, years for the ver uh, lifespan for a red dwarf but there are actually uh, it's for the really massive stars like uh, VY Scuti, where you put uh, you can put them into the solar system, and they would gobble up Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, uh, Jupiter, even Saturn. Uh, some of the really massive big ones, they uh, they only last anywhere between ten to ten to maybe up to 100, 200 million years, and then they just go bang, and you'll get a black hole or a neutron star. In this case, with our sun, what we're just there's not enough mass to cause a nuclear, uh, a neutron star or a black hole. What will happen is, as it as it gets to the end of running out of uh, hydrogen, it will then the core will heat up, the star will start to expand, and what you'll get is the uh, nucle the core t starting to fuse uh, helium, and you'll get to see uh, as it's you'll get to see uh, a, the star expanding out, turning red because even though the core is a lot hotter, uh, it's got to heat a lot more area, so it cools down. Uh, so when we look at temperatures in terms of flames, red's the coolest. You go ye uh, orange, yellow, white, and blue. And, that, uh, and so the star is starting to cool down. And as it... As it runs out of helium, it will then start fusing into oxygen and carbon. And so you'll start to get this, um, this onion effect where you've got layers of hydrogen, layers of helium, layers of oxygen and carbon to the point where you get uh, the core becomes iron. And as it's going through the different elements, it's actually taking a lot quicker time to, to, uh, to go through these these elements and so it only takes about 24 hours to, uh, to fuse all, uh, all the iron and because iron is an endothermic reaction it, it draw, uh, draws in more energy than it puts out this that's it the star dies and uh, uh, throughout this whole process you've already had some some stuff bleaching out uh, so we got your webcam here Roger <laughs> Yeah, I thought I'd be able to show you the moving, but I, of course... I'll oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn the light on later yeah. on. Um, and, and so while it's, while it's expanding, there is shells of material being leached off, but there is one final big push at the end when the core collapses into a white dwarf, which is still very dense materials. So you have something the size of a 20 kilometres, so it could easily fit within Perth, and now you... But it still has the gravitational force of, of a star to actually keep Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, maybe even Mars, if Mars isn't incinerated, orbiting around it. And as the, uh, as the shell of material goes away, it's, uh, it creates this lovely little oval or so. With the, with the uh, it's supernovas, you can actually... You, um, you can actually... Well, <laughs> we... Um, you can actually get planetary nebulas with these, uh, but they do come in weird, weird uh, rectangle shaped. Uh, you get these bipolar ones where you get actual beams coming through, and you uh, and you get 
double double globes coming off them as well so they're pretty spectacular the reason they're called planetary nebulas is because back in the day when they were looking at these first looking at these objects they were they were seeing these small little fuzzy dots and uh, colorful dots and so they looked like planets and they knew they knew they weren't planets but they needed to give them a um, a name so they did actually say uh, it's call them the planet uh, planetary nebulas now I did they, they thought like they, they thought they looked like planets essentially the brighter ones, yeah didn't they? Cause they appear as a small little disk like a planet but a faint planet almost like um, Uranus or, or Neptune sort of appear that a bit larger mm. so and there are some really nice ones out there as well I, I know we've I'm having a look at the chat here and um, uh, so we can go probably go to the Helix Nebula next. Could we? I've seen. I'm doing 47 Tuck at oh, the okay. moment. Because, All right. Um, that's what Mel was first off the rank with. Uh, okay, cool. That was 47 Tuck. Um, we had uh, Ira ask about Mars, but unfortunately, I can't. Just can't do Mars. I, if we're really bored at the end, I can show you how awful it looks because <laughs> of the uh, the oversaturation of it. But uh, my camera just is too sensitive for Mars. Yeah. Um, Oh, I've got the first shot of 47 Tuck there. Awesome. Um, you, you'll notice, um, everyone, that this is a mono camera. That's that's how most astronomy cameras are. Um, they are, are most sensitive that way, and it means that in front of that mono chip, we can put whatever filter we want, because we might not want red, green, blue. We might want sulfur, oxygen, hydrogen, um, alpha, um, different filters on there to pick up different frequencies. So. Um, yeah, that's why this is mono, and I can make color images with this camera, but I use, need to use multiple filters, and that's not something which mm. is easily done live. <laughs> yeah, but it's looking good, this. I, I love the uh, 47, uh, is it 47 Takana. It's a really nice... Uh, it is good. It, this is an interesting demonstration of the size of the field of view that we've got here. So for me, the field of view is a bit too small for 47 Tuck, mm. um, too narrow. And that's because the focal length I'm working at here is 2,180 millimeters. So that's like a, a lens which is a, a bit over two meters long. Um, and so you're looking at a very small part of the night sky. And um, so hence, we've got a very tight cropped view of uh, 47 Takana here. And and you can see this, with, uh, people can see this with their own eye. You can actually, um you can go out. Uh, we can just make it out here in Perth Observatory here in the uh, in the Perth Hills. But if you go out to the country, you can easily see this next with your own eyes next to the small Magellanic cloud. It's always just slightly off to the uh, I think off to the left of it. Oh no, to the right of it uh, as it's orbiting around oh, as it's moving around the night sky. Uh, so and it still it looks good in bin uh, binoculars as well. So you can you if you do go out you can actually uh, and it's out to the country you can kind of see how how wide uh, Roger's uh, camera can take photos of so yeah tiny little tiny <laughs> little speck. Um, so I'm just having a look also while we chat Matt to see if we can get uh, the other request here the cat's eye nebula NGC yeah. 6543. Um, just having problems with things playing up. Oh no, it's too low. Oh, nebula, no, it's too low in the north uh, west. Um, so once we've got a, a couple more frames of 47 tuck, we'll move on to the Helix Nebula. Um, so thanks for that uh, request. Who was that which asked for that? That was Ants Pants 14. <laughs> And we've got um, Tess asking off topic, but I read an article about an asteroid headed in our directions that they've now discovered is actually a rocket. Uh, never landed. Uh, fake news or not. Uh, not necessarily. There's a lot of space junk up there. Um, and there are a lot of rocket bodies, especially there's still... We, we even had, I think there's uh, the one of the first uh, planetary... Uh, Earth science t uh, space telescopes I only just came back to earth within the last month or so i think and uh, it was launched in 1965 so it could possibly 
B, uh, B space junk. We get hit by by debris all the time. Not even not even just rocks, you know, little uh, meteoroids or anything like that. We uh, you know we get hit by s space junk as well. Um, so the, uh, with the with forty seven Takana, this is a globular cluster. So these are really really old stars. These are about twelve billion years old. So think of them. As an active retirement village in terms of their stars um, and this one is 120 light years across and there's around but around about one to two million stars here and uh, it's about 16,000 years ago uh, so 16,000 light years away from us so that light has traveled all that time to get into the telescope right here as well so it, they are really amazing. Our, the, in this in the uh, central area there, there's only the di space between the stars are only about ten percent of a light year. Our nearest star system, the Alpha Centauri system, uh, is about just over four light years away from us. So when we see look up at Alpha Centauri and we see that light coming from that star, it's travelled four years. So, so you got to kind of think, what were you doing four years and? 32, uh, 4.32 uh, years ago, so um, 32 years ago, and um, that'll and, be a test for the mental maths. What's 4.32 yeah. years ago? Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> was it four? Uh, so 4.32 light year, uh, light years away. <laughs> yeah, we're getting ahead of myself here. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to while you uh, you feel free to keep chatting yeah. that, but I'm going to move on from. Uh, 47 Tuck and slow over to the Helix Nebula. Okay, cool. So, so if you were to reduce our Sun and our Centauri system to the size of golf balls, and you put uh, so billiard balls and or pool balls, you put the one in Perth CBD, the uh, Alpha Centauri one would be in, in Karatha. That's how far distances are in space. And so, if we haven't actually made, managed to find any planets. Around, uh, around in uh, globular clusters, but if there was on the night time the uh, side night face of the planet, there just wouldn't be any night time because there's so many so many stars around, so close that uh, at best you get twilight conditions. They are generation two stars, so they are the generation before our sun. Uh, so they are metal poor. So anything that's not hydrogen or helium, astronomers consider metals. Doesn't matter if it's a gas or a liquid; it's still a metal. <laughs> so they are mostly hydrogen and helium, uh, with a little, little bits of oxygen, carbon. So that could be the explanation why we don't see any uh, any planets around uh, in globular clusters, and they are self. Uh, segmenta uh, there's self-segmentation in there as well. So if there's a massive big star forms out uh, on the outer edges or if two stars come uh, merge and become a blue stragula, uh, they do actually migrate in into the center where the smaller ones get kicked out. So unlike really small open star clusters, uh, they all the globular clusters keep their shape. And uh, they don't kick, they don't usually kick out uh, members of the cluster, and uh, and there are there's one or two which they actually believe uh, might be actually the cause of dwarf galaxies that our galaxy has eaten. Uh, yes, our galaxy is a cannibal, um, so so it's um, it, it, they think they've eaten in about ten or eleven uh, dwarf galaxies to get to this size as it is. So, ooh, we've got a couple yeah. that we want to try, uh, the wild duck cluster as well. Yeah. Now, I'm just trying to um, check that we've got a helix here. I think we have. It's just rather faint. But okay. I think it's in. Got the, the hoop. Ah, there we go. Got awesome. It well, um, it's a fairly decent size. Yeah, well, yes, it's a small field of Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I might actually, I might actually just... Um, try centering this a little bit better um, because um, normally what would happen is I'd slew the telescope to its target well actually it's all automated that it would slew there and then it would do a plate solve to accurately center it and it's mm. very accurate to do that um, in this case seeing as I'm doing this manually 
I'm going to just take a guess at which direction we should go here, and I'll I'll get it wrong. Yeah. Uh, we'll just, um, it, whoa! Do you reckon I'm? Oh, I might have actually got it right. Yeah, you know? that would That's, be amazing. I, I, I suggest you not buy a ticket to the Powerball <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> I'm just going to move it. I moved it slightly too far there, so I'm going to move it back twice, two arc minutes. Um, and then, providing this turns out as expected, I'll go back into the live view and go get hmm. a good image coming up for us. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, so that 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 white bit there is that the that's where you have to do a, mer a meridian flip, is it? If you oh, this the the line through yeah. the middle here. Yep. Yeah, that's right. That's that's sort of the um. <laughs> well, if you had a dog, it's almost the dog dead zone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, it's yeah that that line there, one. One side of it is the start of where it would do a meridian flip, and the other side is the end of where it would absolutely have, have to. to. So within that band, it normally yeah. does. Um, people are probably going, "What the heck is he talking about with a, a meridian flip?" It, it's a German equatorial mount which I'm using here, and um, it it uh, look it's hard to show, hard to explain without a um, mount in front of me to talk through it. But there's a a point when you flip from the eastern side of the sky to the western side of the sky or vice versa that you yeah. have to do what we call meridian flip which is a bit of a spin round of the mount so you're using sky x aren't you for this i am yeah, yeah. That, yep. that's what i'm using for this. and number yeah. has I, asked what magnitude works best with your current setup roger um it's it's faint stuff so mm -hmm. I, I photograph anything down to um, oh gee, I'm trying to remember now. Uh, yeah, it was magnitude 21.8 um, was the is the faintest galaxy which I've seen, um, and so galaxies and nebulas which are faint work best for this. So magnitude 17 is, is fantastic. Get nice good um, detail on objects of of that kind of brightness. But um, yeah, things like Mars, Jupiter, Saturn are just way too bright for yeah. it. No hope in the world. And you've even taken, is, is this the telescope you took, um, try, uh, you took your own version of the uh, Hubble Deep Field? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I photographed the um, southern uh, Hubble South Deep Field and that's where I, I worked out the, the faintest I could photograph because I actually could see um, uh, 33, I think it was, galaxies in that Hubble Deep Field. Um, so yeah, hmm. and, <laughs> and I got to laugh. We've, we've got um, hi Jeff. Jeff Scott, who's a volunteer, he's <laughs> he's commented on our stream kindly for us, but he's also an admin of our Perth Observatory page. So he's asked a question on our behalf. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey Jeff, how you going? Ooh, so we've got the first shot of the um, uh, helix coming yeah. up here. That's come up a bit better than I expected, actually. That's yeah. not too bad. Um, that's a one sixty-second exposure, a single sixty-second exposure. Um, so we'll get a few more in here. Um, let's see how it comes up. I think I think this object, which I'm always, I'm sure that's the background galaxy, isn't yeah. it? I always see that in the helix. I'm not sure what uh, galaxy it is. I've never looked that up. Um, probably should. So it seems like we uh, tonight's going to be a planetary nebula night. <laughs> so the Helix Nebula is another planetary nebula, uh, and it's located in the constellation Aquarius. Now, an interesting fact about Aquarius: Aquarius is actually Ganymede, uh, the cupbearer. So not only is Ganymede Aquarius, but it's also a moon of Jupiter, and it was uh, it was found by Carl Ludwig Harding probably before 1824 uh, and its distance has been measured again by the uh, Gaia mission which is ESA's space telescope where they're uh, trying to, to make measurements of how stars are moving in the night sky, where they're moving uh, so that we can get a really good um, knowledge of how stuff is, uh, how far away stuff is around us. And it's a really good uh, good. Uh, mission of it's a fantastic mission uh, it's one of the people here uh, that have, one of the volunteers that have joined me Steve a few, about a month ago I think it was uh, he actually downloaded the very first 
a lot of data and it was 500 gigs of text files. And <laughs> that was when he knew that he had an uh, unlimited download when he realized, oh crap, it was, he thought he had, uh, he had a hundred gig <laughs> uh, download. But uh, so Guy has found that it's, it's actually now, they think it's about 655 light years, give or take as well. And it's roughly around the same age and size as the, uh, as the, uh, the Dumbbell Nebula. So it's also called um, the Eye of God, as well as the Eye of uh, Sauron as well. So that, Roger, that wasn't, that was a fantasy a fantasy <laughs> reference, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and, and I have to apologise if people think I'm ignoring Matt. Sometimes it's because I've got three computers around me with conversations on Discord and Perth Observatory's Facebook page, and I've got planetarium software on another <laughs> iPad here to try to find what I'm next looking at. It's, <laughs> It's a little bit split brain. So apologies, Matt, if I'm ignoring you. No, 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 that's fine. It's this one's actually yeah. <laughs> this one's a little bit bigger than uh, than the dumbbell. It's about uh, f nearly five light years uh, away, f uh, or light uh, five light years across uh, as well. So it's it's this one's a very is always a favourite. Like you'll you'll notice this is used in the. Uh, um, oh, what's that? Uh, the TV show with Neil deGrasse T uh, Tyson, Cosmos. That's it. Uh, so, um, and you can actually see uh, in really nice detail there are dust, uh, dust, you know, little knots in this nebula, and you can see them being blown away by uh, different uh, different shells of material that have left at different times as well. So, they they it's a really nice one to. To have a look at as well, and 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 you know, you if you do a decent uh, image of the Helix Nebby, you can always usually win a astrophotography exhibition award as well, can't you? Actually, we, we should mention that while I go into the yes. next, uh, object, shouldn't I? Yes, um, because the the news is out now of what the prizes are for the Astrofest astrophotography competition and exhibition in 2021, isn't it, Matt? Mm, yep. And um, so I, uh, for those, actually two seconds, I'm just going to think about what I'm doing here. Yes, we're going to that. We'll just slow over to M11. Um, so I curate uh, uh, the that exhibition and competition. And the 2021 AstroFest is slated for happening on the 20th of February. It's a Saturday next year. And so entries are now open for the photography exhibition associated with that. Now. This year, I am very happy with some prizes which I have secured. Um, you went all out here. <laughs> it's not maybe not who, what you know, but who you know. It's, yeah, uh, fantastic that um, camera electronic uh, uh, camera store in Perth, uh, which has supported Astrofest for a long time, they managed to help me out a little bit with getting in contact with Sony. And uh, Sony have come to the party, Sony Australia, with uh, a camera and lens worth $6,300. Um, so if you enter into the um, awards uh, competition for AstroFest next year, you have the chance of winning a Sony Alpha 3. And I don't have the details in front of me, but I think it's a 24 millimeter lens, a, a nice fast one. Um, so yeah, it's over seven and a half thousand dollars worth of prizes that I've got lined up for the AstroFest uh, this year. So you want to get your, your photos in if you, if you do do astrophotography. Mm. Um, the entries close on the 4th of December and that means that there's only uh, two new moons um, between, well, this new moon and then the November new moon. Uh, and then it's it's all over Red Rover. You need to have your entry in. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah. Yeah. Get, but... get them in. The, the details are on the Astrofest website. If you Google Perth Astrofest, uh, it's all there. Yeah. So actually, I've got a I've got a ton of photos. I've just got to go process now. So I got to find I got to find some time to try to uh, get that ready for. In the next yeah, time. there's certainly nothing wrong with people entering photos they've taken prior to these two months. It's just if you want to get something new. Oh, I know, um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. 
All right, so we've got um, M11 coming up here. That was a request from Numbat on the Numbat, Discord yes. channel. So um, that's coming up fairly nice there. So I'm just going to go into the full live view here, live stack, and do my standard 60 seconds. Now, as excuse me, as far as um, exposure times go, for simplicity tonight, um, I'm using just a, a standard exposure time of 60 seconds, and, th and that's enough to get me decent detail, but not mm. have a sitting around waiting for too long. Um, if you're doing deep sky photography, you might do exposure times up to, up, well, I do up to 20 minutes in individual exposures in individual frames, but more normally five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. Um, so these exposure times are normally fairly long and that introduces some complexities in terms of tracking and guiding and so on, which the astrophotographers out there will be well, well familiar with the pains of such thing. <laughs> and we, um, all, we all hope you've got your all favorite beverage with you while you're watching us. Jeff, I hope you've got a nice uh, glass of uh, red wine there. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't have one tonight. Don't you? What did uh, I do wrong? I'm drinking coffee, so. <laughs> so <laughs> and it's straight coffee, so. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we've got M11 here. Let's see how it goes. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's a little bit mushy there. We'll see how uh, the next couple of exposures come mm. up. So this was discovered by Godfrey Kirsch in 1681, and uh, and also Charles Messier added it uh, as his in his original uh, 45 ca uh, object catalogs. So when we mentioned Charles Messier, he's a, ver a very famous French astronomer. He was wanting to look of look at, uh, at comets and kept on seeing these fuzzy fuzzy things in the night sky and wanted to make a catalog so he didn't get his hopes up all the time. So this is the 11th object that he noted down. And this is an open star cluster. So we've already seen 47 Takana, which was a globular cluster. So we're thinking old ret uh, retirement village, active retirement village as well, because they're stars, they're, uh, they, they're massive big balls of burning gas. Um, and now we're looking at, you know, in terms of star age, for, if we're looking at hum, you know, human re, uh, relative time, we're looking at uh, pre, uh, you know, toddler all the way up to university uh, here or TAFE or you just get kicked out of the home because uh, they're, these are very young stars. So we, we've, they're formed from a nebula uh, with the stellar nursery where you've got a big cloud of, of gas and dust and uh, that, that's used all the... All, all of that material to make the stars it can and anything left over is blown away. And you'll, what's left over are the stars that it's made and they're just loosely orbiting around each other and eventually over a couple of hundred million years they'll kick themselves out and they'll go off on their own way uh, around, around the galaxy. So this one has about 95 light years in radius. Uh, they think it's about 300 and... 16 million years old as well so there is a so that so relatively actually a fairly oldish open star cluster you know they're, they've they've got to get themselves on their way around the galaxy around the galaxy <laughs> don't you think roger sorry matt i was in in five other late la, la, la. <laughs> 300 million years old yeah yeah 300 million yeah. years that's not to be sneezed at. No, no. There's about 870 members at least. So, so it's a it's right. a fairly big it's a fairly big open cluster. So it would have been interesting to see what the what the size of the nebula would have been back there, back in the day. Mm. Now this is looking a little bit mushy here. I think mm. um, the, the 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 optical tube which I'm using here is not um, the most modern or the most perfect. But mm. um, so that means normally if I'm slewing around the night sky, I'll refocus it when I change hemispheres. And I think this is n not quite spot on, but it's uh, oh well, mm. it's what we got. Um, that's M11. Um, and the reason it's called uh, the Wild Duck Cluster is because you can kind of see a V shape there. Um, and so, really? yeah, yeah, well, uh, you really? could, yeah, well, 
I, I, I mean, look, it is astronomy objects, and they are fairly imaginative with their names. I'll give you that. Yeah, yeah, and and also I'm running off a couple of hours sleep, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, like they all were with the names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, but um, as they say, as they say on Mighty Ducks, uh, ducks fly together. So. <laughs> I'm going to move on to M6, Matt. The, uh, I think that was the next one. Was I go? Yeah, M6 yep. from M Lagoon. Um, we'll see what M6 looks like. And that's um, one that actually does look like a butterfly. And you might see here on my screen, um, this is sort of the, the horizon as it is now from, viewed from my observatory. And um, the you can see the Milky Way starting to set in the, in the west here. Mm. We're looking at M11 there now. M6 is another open cluster in the towards the centre of the Milky Way. <laughs> in fact, almost... <laughs> Mac Bang in the centre of the Milky Way there, so that's where we'll go to next. Have, um, you, have you ever tried to take the, a photo of the Milky Way with that fantastic camera you've got to the west of your observatory that you get all those nice sun, uh, sunset images from? Yeah, um, the, the, you mean the security camera? Yeah, yeah. The um, one that you know, <laughs> with the security cameras, actually. They, it's amazing how good modern security cameras are because... Um, they are good enough to do decent frame rates without uh, artificial light. And mm. um, they can actually stack exposures of the Milky Way from the security camera. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, right, so I'm going to go to M6, slew the telescope across to that. Um, after the lagoon, we'll be up for some more suggestions of what you'd like to see. Mm. There's a bunch of other, other nebulas and things through that central region of the Milky Way. Um, but uh, there's also plenty of other stuff in the night sky. So let's just try, I'm just going to check that we've got the pointing OK here for M6. Also, while Roger's doing this, we do have a lunar photography workshop and we've got two spots left for next Thursday if you guys want to come up and take your, uh, bring up your camera and take a shot of the moon uh, through some of our telescopes. And Roger will be doing that, uh, will be running that workshop. So if you want, yep. to, if you want to do that, you can go and uh, book on our website, perthobservatory.com.au. And uh, there's also... Uh, coming up in the 12th of December, we're going to be doing an astrophotography workshop as well with Roger. So not only will you be able to sit and listen to all the and him pass on the knowledge to you uh, about doing also nightscapes and taking photos through tel uh, through telescopes, um, uh, you'll uh, as it's yeah you you'll also do pr uh, practical uh, practical as well in. in you and dinner as well, so you'll have dinner, and then once we've, if it's clear, we'll go up and uh, take some sh shots through telescopes, and also there'll be tripods there, so you can do some nightscape uh, workshops, uh, nightscape shots as well, so that you can find out what you want to do. So you can also book on the website, uh, perthobservatory.com.au, for that as well. Now, Matt, I'm going to jump in here. I think yeah. um, I, it's interesting looking at the, the quick focus shot yeah. here. How, how little of M6 we're seeing. That, that just that's pretty. Um, now uh, that's that's really interesting because like we, you can you'd have absolutely no hope with uh, Ptolemy's cluster nearby because uh, <laughs> Ptolemy's cluster is is massive compared to the uh, M6 and uh, yeah it's it's interesting seeing because we yeah. you know, we usually show M6 on a night sky tour because. You can easily fit it into the telescope, but that's it's interesting seeing um, yeah. the size. So yeah, it shows how tight the field of view is. So Tweet. I'm not gonna. I don't think I'll do a live um, stack on this one of 60 mm. seconds because we're just seeing so little of there. We'll we'll find some other. Objects. But you can kind of see the uh, a little bit of the butterfly there. You can see down near the where it says chat, the the two antennas, and then the uh, the wing, bit of the wing and the body there. So. Yep. All right. So um, what I'll do is I think I'll move on to the next mm. request, which was the Lagoon Nebula. Mm. Um, so I'll put uh, that back in. But we'll just so I'll just go back to the west horizon here for you to get a perspective of where we're where we're looking here mm. and uh, go to the butterfly the... is actually much younger than the wild duck. So this one's that was that's about ninety four point two million years 
old and uh, it's actually about six light years uh, in radius so it's it must be it's must be fairly close then it's um, it was discovered by Giovanni Battista Huradini in uh, 1654 uh, 50, uh, as well so right. hmm. okay the lagoon's looking much better the lagoon again is a bit big for my field of view but uh, it's still got nice nice detail in there so I'll do a, a live stack of this one for us 60 seconds hmm. And this is a nice that. one. See how that turned out. I see that Jeff has requested uh, NGC 253 or 1365. I love mm. NGC 1365, Spanish answer. Um, it might be high enough by the end of the night. Um, well, actually, it probably is by now, actually. Um, I was checking earlier at 7.30 and it was a bit low. Um, NGC 1365 is one of the many fantastic galaxies in the Fornax constellation. There's the Fornax mm. galaxy cluster and um, you know, even if you take a, a photograph of the Fornax cluster with a 400 millimeter camera lens, um, you will see the field of view just littered with little galaxies. Um, some of them being quite quite um, structured in shape like 1365, the Spanish dancer. So mm. it is a good area to photograph. Um, He's also mentioned uh, NGC 1097, that's another good one. Um, so we'll see how we go with uh, this and then move on to those. Yeah. And if you've got any more um, requests, everyone, then feel free to. Now, Mel through. says, what is the uh, equalis uh, up the top right? That, Mel, as a horse lover, you will love this. It's the little horse. That's the little horse constellation. <laughs> now this uh, lagoon image is coming up okay for one exposure. Mm. Um, yeah, my focus is slightly off, but I'm not going to try and fix that in in the middle of the live stream. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you, you can one interesting thing to talk about here. You can see these spikes coming off the stars. Mm. That's that's what we call blooming. That's this particular type of CCD which I've got here is designed to be as sensitive as possible and um, very linear, linear in its operation and, and it, just the characteristics of it mean that you, you land up with the situation where there's less physical medium between the pixels on the chip substrate. They don't have these walls between the pixels and so what you get is basically electrons overflowing from one pixel to another and that's what's happening here. That, that blooming is, is light which is bleeding out of the pixel which that star is hitting into yeah. the ones up and down from it. So nothing we can do about that other than post-processing, remove that, but um, it means that the camera is more sensitive for what I need it for. Yeah. And this was this was a uh, an identifier as a guide to find Earth on uh, Battlestar Galactica. I actually just recently watched this episode and it was like, that's the Lagoon Nebula! <laughs> Look, to be fair, I absolutely love the, uh, yeah. particularly the new Battlestar Galactica series. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> probably, we got uh, you talking you, about it. Yeah. You guys are probably seeing here a bit of posterization, this sharp edges in the shading. That's just because I'm working through um, Team Viewer here, which is compressing the image a bit coming from my remote telescope, um, unfortunately. Yeah, we're not, we're actually not there like we were back in May. <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah. Actually, you haven't mentioned where we're doing this from, so... Um, I, I've got a, you at the central wheat belt, so... Oh, uh, there we go, yeah. yeah. I've yeah. got a property out in the central wheat belt where I, I host uh, telescopes, so if anyone on this has a telescope they'd like to remote operate from the central wheat belt, I'm the guy to talk to. And, um, yeah, I also run workshops out there, so one-on-one -on -one and uh, group workshops at beautiful dark skies. Um, an hour and a half or so from the Perth Hills. Mm. And you, you also usually go out to Lake Lishenot here every, every so often and do yeah, something I, there as actually well. actually I've got a workshop there on, um, with one-on-one uh, -on -one with someone on Monday or Tuesday next week. Oh, nice. Mm. So, so this, a, sorry? 
Yeah, the workshop's been put off since July. It's just crazy. The cloud we had during uh, July, August, and, the, and then uh, all the way in September. Actually, I, I did work out that. So, so I, as a tour administrator for the Perth Observatory, I keep stats on um, you know, our tours, and it works out that we get 77% of our night sky, uh, sky tours are clear. Now, that is the complete opposite for these live streams. These live streams... <laughs> And, you know, this is, we've also now, we come, we must be coming up to now uh, half and half in terms of the amount of sat days I did while we were closed down and now moving it to Wednesdays. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 we're cursed. I've got, I've got to find that black cat who, that walked by me. Or, mm-hmm. yeah, I didn't smash any mirrors or anything like that. <laughs> Matt, I'm going to move on to one of uh, Jeff's suggestions. But in the meantime, yeah. I see there's a question from Tez regarding um, why this, this object has um, the cloudiness and the previous one didn't. So maybe you want to talk to that while I move on to the next object for us. Yeah, okay. So this is a massive big nebula. So this is this is a, actually about 55 light years by 20 light years across. So instead of being shell a shell of material coming off off the star uh, and like we did with the helix nebula and with the dumbbell this is a massive big cloud and of of hydrogen helium carbon uh, there's even base alcohols as well it's it's not you know whiskey grade or anything like that uh, and you'd never you know you uh, you wouldn't get out of the solar system before you died reach trying to get to this uh, to get that type of alcohol but this is a massive, big stellar nursery, and so there's got to be a lot of uh, a lot of gas and dust there to create stars. And so this one's this one was actually found by Giovanni who had, uh, Battista Huradini as well in 1655, just like the last one that we showed. And uh, and you can actually see this in binoculars as well. And the reason they call it the lagoon is because it looks like two lagoons with with a central uh, with a dark bar across it, and uh, that's the sandbar which you yeah, you would recognise. So this is and, a. And I think he, I think the previous object he might have been referring to was the open clusters as compared to the the nebulas. So the yeah. nebula material which is yet to form into stars or is being blown off stars in the case of planetary nebulas versus um, open clusters where that material has already formed into stars. Yeah, so this is the very beginning of what a star's life is, right here. And um, hey, how, now, you, how are you going? <laughs> and, um, and so yeah, so this is about 4,000 to 6,000 light years away from us as well. So, and you can easily see this with binoculars and, and telescopes. And even if you take night, uh, night scapes of the Milky Way, you, you can actually see this as well, or at least with the Nikon you can, that we've got here at the observatory. All right, so now I'm, uh, I've moved on from M8, the Lagoon Nebula, onto uh, M17. I just thought I may as well um, mm. capitalise on the fact we're on the uh, western sort of this horizon, western hemisphere of the sky here, before I move all the way across to the Fornax constellation yeah. of some night uh, galaxies. So got M17 coming up here. And M17 is another nebula. It's got a few different names, but let's call it the Swan Nebula. Yeah, um, there's Omega Nebula as well. Sh- yeah. Shapeless it, 40, uh, 45. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Gum 89. Is the catalog. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is um, technically they rate they rank this as being 20 arc minutes by 20 arc minutes. So that's not a bad size for my chip, which has a field of view of sort of 25 by 15. So it actually fits reasonably nicely in the field of view now. Mm. Ah, that I hate what TeamViewer is doing yeah. to the um, to the detail here. So um, we'll see how this goes after a couple more exposures. This- getting pretty decent there so this was uh, this one's actually been discovered by Philip Lo de, de la Chise in 1745 and uh, it's another one that's uh, Charles Messier has has catalogued in his Messier catalog in 1764 and it is again located in the Sagittarius 
constellation just like the lagoon as well so again this yeah. is another this is another star forming region and another nebula this one's about 5000 to 6000 light years away so you know you're, it's taken that long to get here and uh, so and it's about 15 light years in diameter as well so uh, mm. yeah 15 is um is quite quite large really for that, isn't it it's amazing when you think how well relatively small it is in a telescope um and yeah, yeah so large yeah and um, it's it's part of a uh, interstellar matter a cloud of interstellar matter that's roughly about 40 light years in diameter as well and it's got about a massive 30,000 uh, suns so it's pretty awesome as well this, it always gets me as an astrophotographer the the sharpness of this the rectangular sort of yeah. right shape there. I, I you know for a, I remember back when I was starting astrophotography and I, I took my first shots of this. I couldn't work out for the life of me why I would have a square object on the surface of my chip obscuring the light <laughs> from the nebula because it just looks like someone's plonked a piece of you know square paper on the chip. Yeah. Blocking the light. I think Je uh, uh, Jeff's actually uh, mentioned that to me before as well, uh, about that square as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to let uh, this exposure finish, and then I'm going to move on to um, to over to Fornax to mm. get some different types of objects. Seeing as uh, we've we've had such a look at galaxies here, so Jeff, how about I do? Jeff's getting into the sci-fi here. He says it's uh, it's a ball cube. <laughs> We've got our, uh, uh, actually, there was someone in the chat earlier that was saying top uh, marks for um, Star Trek references. So there, there we've got a reference there as well. So, but this is, this is actually one of the very young, uh, youngest uh, nebulas out there. This is about a million years old as well. So, yeah. Um, look, I'm slightly more favorable to Star Trek than Star Wars, Matt. Yeah. But, um, I still want to keep that sci-fi <laughs> limited. Um, let's see, this is now to uh, 28. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's, it's got the youngest, one of the youngest clusters, I mean, sorry, in, in a million, yeah, it's a million years old. That's, yeah, in, in this, in this, uh, in the Sw Swan Nebula. All right, so I'm just slewing the telescope around to the opposite side of the sky, uh, to the, the east. Um, and I'll see what um, we see with some galaxies here. They mm. should be poking well above the wall of the observatory by now, but we'll see. Actually, my uh, Xbox uh, One hard drive is called Fornux. <laughs> yeah, right. Interesting. They, they borrowed the name, did they? No, no, no. I just named my hard drives after constellations. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my... Um, my uh it's my two hard drives on my desktop i called scorpio and centaurus i think i think it is so yeah okay. right now let's see it's got there so let's just take some focus shots it's going to be interesting um seeing what the focus is like for this having swapped hemispheres of the uh night sky hey that's a nice Oh, yeah, that's coming up all right. Actually, there was a supernova in this galaxy last year, which had everyone photographing it. Yeah, and MC, M61 had one uh, earlier this year as well, so... Just goes to show how many there are. Yeah. Because yeah. they did used to do supernova searches here back in the 90s and 2000s at the observatory. Mm, absolutely. Right, so I'm going to do a 60-second exposure of this uh, NGC 1365, the Spanish Dancer, one of my favourite galaxies. So the me, uh, so if the Fornux is actually Latin for the furnace. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was actually one of the constellations added by French astronomer Nicolas uh, Louise Delacaille in the mid 18th century, and there's no myths uh, associated. So that's that's the problem with some of the uh, with the some uh, the southern hemisphere uh, targets is they they don't have any mythology to them. They're just like there's Musket the Fly, <laughs> Tucana, <laughs> Tucana, which is the toucan, you know. Well, and there's Triangulum. The Triangulum, yeah. 
Yeah, there's the uh, the com- uh, the one that looks like the compass as well. So uh, it's just bad form on the Br- uh, British Navy, considering that they are uh, the only they I know from my great grandfather who um, loved his whiskey and got his daily whiskey on on the uh, on his uh, boat when he was in World War Two. So. They were they weren't a dry ship back in the day. They should have been coming up with some good sto- uh, constellations <laughs> and some good mythology. So, actually, I'm impressed here, Matt. We've only got a single six, sixty second exposure, but look at the peripheral detail. Yeah. I mean, it's no- noisy as anything, but look at the peripheral detail that we're getting in the, the, in the outer arm. parts of this this arm. I mean, you've yeah. got galaxy material coming all the way out here, knots of nebulosity through here, obviously. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite surprised for 60 seconds. That, that's pretty good. Yeah, you can see that nice bar across uh, uh, and the two arms, uh, the arms coming off each of the bar as well. So mm-hmm. our, our galaxy is also a barred spiral galaxy, but uh, it's it's more pronounced. It's it's You've got a number more of arms spiral. coming off the two main arms you get. Yeah, it's, our, our galaxy is much more spiral, I'd say. Yeah, like, like it is a bad spiral, but it, it's got that bar. But it is more spiral than this one, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's not. It's not a like a Roman candle, like uh, like M83 or the other this uh, the uh, the uh, the pinwheel galaxy in the northern hemisphere as well. Mm. But then that said, you know we're only going what, off what the uh, research tells us, and I reckon in my lifetime the the shape of our <laughs> galaxy is going to be changed a few times yet. Yeah, <laughs> as well. Yeah, so it's called an intermediate uh, spiral galaxy, and it's actually in the constellation Dordana as well. So, it's as in the, the Milky Way you're talking Dor- about. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yep. And uh, so, uh, so yeah, it's it was dis- this one's actually discovered by James Dunlop uh, in Parramatta Observatory. Are we talking about 1365 now? Yeah, yep, yep. Okay, yep. Right. Um, yeah, about 50, 56 or around 50 million light years away. Yeah, it's, yes, yeah, yeah, about, was it um, 69 million light years away from us? We're seeing this really? object. Yeah. That, that high? Yeah. I thought of 56. Give or, yeah, give or take uh, 21.3 mega, uh, mega, mega parsecs. So, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and for those of you who are always wondering about parsecs, uh, yes, George uh, George Lucas did get the measurements wrong, um, but he he was trying to use parsecs for time, but it's actually a distance measurement. So Han Solo could possibly have done the Kessel Run in twelve parsecs. He just cut. He was just a shorter journey. So, yep. <laughs> and the way we get the way we get parsecs is uh, you take an image of a star. Uh, say in January and you wait six months and you take another photo and then you use Pythagoras theorem to work out um, the parsecs. So, yeah. Matt, I wonder if we've got anyone watching us or if we're just chatting to ourselves now because it's been an hour and a quarter. I wonder... <laughs> I'll have a I wonder look. how long we should keep going. We've got 20... Time. We've still got 25 people. So, yeah. Wow, so pretty good. Yep. So, look, we can... We can we, uh, do you want to try do Sculptor Galaxy? And uh, we oh, can yeah. finish it there. Okay. Yeah. Um, I might, you know what, I, I'm, I'm a sucker for galaxies. I'm going to, on the way to the sculpture, I'm going to stop in at another one that Jeff suggested, yeah. um, 1097, because that's another favourite of mine. Um, yeah. They're just nearby each other, so I'm just going Mel's to... watching. Numbat's still here and enthralled as well. That's good. And, uh, yeah, and welcome to all the new viewers here as well so hopefully yeah i hope you don't turn them away too. Yeah. <laughs> but hey as long as they come to a night sky tour at yeah the then it's all good right well yeah you got to get your tickets in soon because we're, uh, we're nearly about to uh to book out december now so really <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah wow. so are we tell me matt in december are we still doing having to do decreased tour numbers due to COVID? at the moment yeah so we're still yeah. running at 40 uh 40 people per tour um, I think so restrictions fives um, should be well at the moment they're saying 24th of October uh, but right. so they sh- within the next week we should know um, know what should happen so 
I reckon, um, you know, people who have a tour are now are getting awesome value for money because we haven't increased the price when we've had to decrease the number of people on the tour. Yeah. So we're getting a far less um, full tour for the same money. Um, it is, it, and actually, to be honest, for a host like myself who volunteers to operate these nights, it's so much more relaxing having a small group, and I do mm. enjoy it. We have a good time. You get more time looking through the telescopes as well. I put a nice um, filter on uh, as it's on the 25 mil eyepiece for the, with the 30 inch ob uh, Obsession telescope, and I had a look at uh, Dumbbell Nebula and was completely blown away by how cool it looked. Um, yep. We uh we got an uh it someone asked uh it's when uh, when is the astrophotography workshop? So that's the twelfth of December. So it's a Saturday and it goes from one p.m. to ten uh, p.m. as well. So it's definitely a good night as well. And uh, those, those full day ones are always great fun. Um, yeah, yeah, I do enjoy those. Here we go. It's yeah, ten ninety seven uh, is this galaxy. Nice. And, um, Starting to get some, that's a single exposure, got some nice detail there, peripheral detail, second galaxy there. Uh, we'll just wait for two more exposures before I move on to yeah. um, the NGC 253, the silver coin. And uh, yeah, so this one was discovered by Wersh William Herschel in uh, 1790, in actually in uh, the 9th of, uh, 9th of October, so only just recently, uh, you know, in terms, at its, at its anniversary and um, it's a severely interacting galaxy that's uh, that's obvious uh, with obvious tidal dis uh, debris and distortions caused by the interaction of its uh, companion galaxy NGC 97A so I think that might be that one right there that's that's causing the the distortion here and it's actually had an, uh, three supernovas uh, since uh, since being observed in 1992, so it's had a it's it's had a pretty interesting uh, couple of decades recently. Hmm. Now, while this is taking another shot, mm. I, I thought, Matt, seeing as I, I mentioned that I'm a volunteer host of the observatory, but it's quite possible that there's people on our live stream here which don't understand the Perth Observatory is run by volunteers now. Yeah. Um, the Perth Observatory Volunteer Group took over operation of the Perth Observatory in 2015. I happen to be chairperson, but hopefully that's not a reflection on me. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, so we, it, it's all volunteers which run these these tour nights. We do employ a handful of people, like skeleton staff, such as Matt, to op to manage the tours. But in terms of when you come to a tour, it's it's about eight volunteers we need to run every tour, um, and any money which you spend coming to the tour or in the shop at the, the, the Astro shop at the Perth Observatory goes directly to keeping the lights on. Um, we don't have magical grant money that keeps the lights on. We have to get that from the tours that we enjoy doing to show you the night sky. Mm. And uh, yeah, you can also donate to us through Patreon and so we can keep on doing this as well. Uh, so. So, and we'll give you some cool merch as well. So we just uh, interviewed our latest victims. I, I mean, our next potential volunteers <laughs> <laughs> as well. So uh, we, uh, so we, we have got about 19 that are, we are that are about to just start their training. So uh, awesome. Yep. So we're getting them ready for our world domination plans. Did I say that Fantastic. out loud? <laughs> so yeah. So. Sorry. This is coming up quite nicely, this uh, NGC 1097. This one's a little bit closer than, than 1365, the Spanish dancer we were on previously. This one's about 45 million light years away. Um, but uh, beautiful um, face on barred spiral. Mm. And after this exposure, I'm going to move on to the last one for tonight, I think, uh, the uh, silver coin. Yeah. And uh, so we actually got we got three, uh, two, three, well, three new uh, trainees coming off their P's. Uh, this week we had Flavia, uh, so it's Ishara, and uh, and who was the other one? Oh, dang, I can't believe I've forgotten. <laughs> sorry, sorry, the other one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so thankfully, because we are at reduced numbers of our volunteers because of the COVID uh, crisis, so our younger volunteers are having to step up a little bit uh, and let the uh, 
uh, the older volunteers um, have a break and make sure they don't get it. So luckily here in West Australia, we've been, we've had, uh, we've done the right thing. We haven't had, uh, it's, we haven't uh, had really big outbreaks. So we've uh, certainly good. been a lot easier being here in West Australia than say Victoria. So now I'm just going to um, try and just center this a little bit more before I go to mm. the live view sort of feed of this one this is the silver coin galaxy ngc 253 nice big bright one so the pre that previous galaxy that we've just we were looking at beforehand that's 40 mil 45 million light, uh, light years away from us so again we're looking at stuff that's left left that galaxy 45 million years ago so so yeah so it's it's just you know it's after the dinosaurs um bit the dust but uh yeah there's some it's it's we're starting to get to some stupendous <laughs> stupendous i wonder how I, I never remember how far away ngc 253 is in comparison hmm. I, um, that was i think wasn't that 60 um 69 million was that the was uh, the spanish dancer one uh, no i'm i'm meaning this one the, the silver coin how far oh, away it is. okay um hey you know i'm useless for numbers like this I um, yes so remember. we're Last. looking just having a look here where is it just starting my first exposure of, of this one um, yeah this one was actually found by uh, Caroline Herschel as well in 1783 as well and she found it during one of her comet searches um, and it was a half a century later, uh, jo um, her nephew, John Herschel, observed it using the 18-inch um, metallic mirror reflector at the Cape of Good Hope as well. So that was, yeah, I was trying to find out how, it's, it, it's 90,000 uh, 90, light years across, so it's actually smaller than our, our galaxy. Um, as yeah, right. Yeah, so our galaxy they think is around about um, about 110,000 light, light years across. So. Uh, All right, so here we go, almost there. Now we haven't been able to show you guys Mars tonight because my camera's too sensitive for that. But you should just step outside and look at Mars. It is so bright. Yeah, we'll uh, I'll race up. We'll probably be a half an hour or so, but we'll race up and quickly try and do something. So I'll, um, if you guys hang around, uh, maybe get you refill, get you some food. We'll quickly, uh, I'll quickly try and get up there and get everything set up and then just do another uh, stream. So Okay, that sounds good, mate. All right, uh, we've got the first image of NGC 253 here. I'm just trying to get the uh, brightness as good mm. as I can for coming through the, it does look the compression. Like a cigar. <laughs> so you can see how big this galaxy is in the field of view. Mm. It really needs like a, in my, in the case of my telescope, a four, four image mosaic to make it fit nicely. Um, but uh, yeah, we're just doing a live of the one field of view here. Uh, see how this second image comes down, get rid of some of the noise. <laughs> so uh, the uh, Sculptor Galaxy is 11.4 million light years away from us. So that's why it's so big in the in Rogers. Yeah. 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 And it's also called the Silver Coin. Uh, so, so Silver Coin or the Silver Dollar uh, Galaxy as well. So. So yeah, and it's going uh, undergoing a period of intense star formation as well. So you're getting a lot of baby stars forming there. It's breeding stars like rabbits. Not as much it as is. not as much as the large Magellanic cloud though. It is fascinating when you see um, narrowband mixed with LRGB of of this uh, galaxy. You start to really see these knots mm. of nebulosity and star, presumably star forming regions pop out. I always. I mean, I'm not a physicist, so I guess I'm not an expert on this, but I look at something like that and I figure that's got to be in a region of nebulosity and hot activity there, which is potentially forming stars, but um, yeah. Yeah. So this is the uh, this is at the centre of this uh, sculptor group of galaxies. 
uh, and it's the nearest group of galaxies to the Milky Way as well. So uh, the Sculptor Galaxy is the brightest galaxy in the group and one of the most intrinsically bright uh, bright uh, galaxies in the vicinity of ours as well. It's only surpassed by the Andromeda Galaxy and the Sombrero Galaxy as well. So it's a it's a it's a nice object that we can show on a night sky tour as well. So especially when mm. we don't have a moon. Yep. So yeah. we'll get a few more shots of this one. The starburst is happening in a couple of super, several super star clusters in the centre there. It was discovered by Hubble Space Tel uh, Telescope. One of, yeah. So, the, yeah, it's uh, it's star formation is also high in the northeast of in uh, of the Sculptor Galaxy's disk, where there are a number of red supergiants can be found, and it's in its halo there are young stars that have uh, that is as well as some amounts of neutral hydrogen as well so mm. all right so that's um coming up okay there the one interesting thing is that uh, another thing that's interesting about this is even though the galaxy is smaller its central black hole uh, is about five million t uh, times uh, this the mass of our sun which makes it slightly heavier than Sagittarius A star, our um, our black hole. Right. As well. All right. So I'll finish that, um, and mm. we'll wrap up very soon. But I might just um, be able to show you the telescope that we've been using tonight briefly. I'll see if the uh, the webcam will come on just as a bit of curiosity. Um, hopefully, the wind hasn't blown the webcam. <laughs> Um, I've just turned on the light, so hopefully... Yep, there, there we go. go. Hello, Got telescope. The, so it's pointing straight up at uh, Sculptor, the Sculptor Galaxy at the moment. Oh. Um, and what I'll do now, seeing as we're finishing off, I'll just come back and... Did you uh, want to try and get Pluto? Uh, <laughs> oh, nah, nah. I think we'll, we'll leave Pluto for another night. Pluto okay. is up, up at the moment. Um, but... Um, yeah, we'll leave that for another night. So you can see the telescope is parking at the moment. And uh, then we'll wrap up the night. Yes. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for joining in. Yeah. Okay, guys. <laughs> Mel says it looks like a dialect. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'd better turn off the light so that no one else in my observatory gets annoyed at the, uh, the light. There. Yeah. So goodbye. <laughs> right. There we go. Light off. So you've uh, you've automated almost fully automated your uh, your observatory up there, haven't you? Oh, it, yeah. absolutely, Matt. No, it's yeah. the only way to do it these days. I mean, we all work, we have day jobs, and um, automation. You know, to get astrophotography. Um, I always figured when I started out with astrophotography, it was the way to go because it, it just takes a bit of pressure off, and you can get mm. some more data. And uh, yeah, we 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 love when we're on tours. You're showing us, oh, look, it's pretty windy out there at the moment, or <laughs> as well. Yeah, well, actually, tonight it's a, it's a beautiful night tonight. Um, it's uh, dead clear. It, the wind wind is sitting around 10k per hour, down to, well, between 5 and 15k per hour, which is, is basically a gentle breeze. Mm. Um, and it's nice and dark, so no moisture. So, yeah, it's fantastic viewing conditions tonight. And the last... Um, Last few nights have all been the same. I noticed last night in Perth we had cloud and a bit of moisture, but not out in the central week. Yeah, we've, they're starting to do some backburning, which is good, especially coming up to summer. But it's uh, it doesn't help us with our <laughs> with the view in yeah, the last night. Me out in the central wheat belt, most of that doesn't affect me. Yeah. Um, it's, it's fairly coastal. The um, the only time we get affected by that kind of stuff is stubble fires in on the other side yeah. of summer. We um, had. Uh, we had, I went down to Point Perrin uh, to do an astronomy night down there, to, for, actually for some people I know. And, uh, and as I was driving down there, I saw the bushfire and the, uh, the easterlies blowing it out to, out to, the, uh, to the Indian Ocean. And I'm thinking, oh, no, it's, it's just down near Mandra. You know, I've, I'm going to Rockingham, so I won't have to worry about it. And it's, as I'm getting closer to Rockingham, it's getting closer and closer. And then when you look up, when you reach... Rockingham, it's just you know, like, oh, no. 
And the whole reason we were doing it on the, on the Monday was because we moved it from the Wednesday because it was going to, well, as you found out, Roger, you were on, at the observatory that night. It was it was raining. So. It did rain, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my last tour at yeah. the observatory last weekend or whenever it was. No, it was on Wednesday, as you said. I was um, running between buildings to get umbrellas and it was wet. <laughs> um, anyway, we should wrap it up. No the problem. Thing we got, the last thing I've got here, Matt, is <clears throat> you can measure sky darkness. And um, this is a, an instrument out of my observatory which measures the darkness of the sky. And tonight it is 21.97, which is very dark. You yeah. can't get much darker. So we have fantastic dark skies here in the country. you just got to get at some. Yeah, so definitely try and... Definitely try and get some take some time off, while, uh, or, or even for if you might want to plan it for your Christmas holidays. But definitely go out to some of these country towns; they are fantastic. And there's a lot of people uh, doing this at the moment with us not being able to go overseas. So Roger and I passed uh, overtook a lot of caravans going up north. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, it's and yeah, it's you guys. You will. You know, you always remember how good the sky is once you go out to no light pollution and you're forever trying to go out and uh, get make time to actually go out and see the, the amazing Milky Way galaxy that we can see. All right, guys. Well, thanks very much for, uh, for joining us. We've d done an extra long one. Uh, and uh, thanks, Roger, for joining. No problem, man. No problem. Thanks, so, man. guys, if you want to follow us, you can follow us on our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and you get all the latest astronomy knowledge and what's happening here at the observatory. Uh, if you could like, hit, uh, like or subscribe to our YouTube channel, you, you'll also get notifications when we do this. Or and uh, yeah, hopefully you could, uh, if you like what we do, uh, if you could uh, s uh, donate to us on Patreon, that would be fantastic because that allows us to keep on doing this uh, this stuff as well. So that would be really good, and you get some cool merch if you as well if you. Uh, start donating through patreon as well so thanks very much guys we hope you have a great time with this one i will quickly start packing uh, up and heading up to the 14 dome so that we can try and at least have a look at mars so keep stay up and uh we'll um i'll uh, we'll get on onto the 14 within the next hour sorry half an hour 45 minutes okay guys we'll see you later for now